Hi, I'm Jacob Howlrun, the editor of the National Interest Magazine. And on behalf of the Center for the National Interest, I'm delighted to welcome for our webinar today, Ambassador Anatoly Antonov. He will be speaking about US-Russia relations today. We'll begin with a 10 to 12 minute presentation by him, which will be followed by questions from me and hopefully from you, the audience, as well. With that, I would like to invite Ambassador Antonov to begin his presentation. Uh, good afternoon. It's a great pleasure for me to be with you. It's a great pleasure to uh, discuss uh, Russian-American relations. Uh, of course, it's uh, not an easy task. Uh, it's very difficult uh, to talk about Russian-American relations. Too many contradictions have accumulated. There is an ongoing debate on who is more at fault for their deplorable current state. There are contrasting views on who should take the first step towards the other side. I have to admit that for now, this process resembles walking in a circle without any clear perspective of finding common ground. On many occasions, I had to persuade the American public that Russia and the United States are not enemies and that we cannot afford the luxury of not talking to each other despite all the existing disagreements. Due to objective reasons, the well-being of the whole planet depends on the quality of Russian-United States uh, relations. We must remember that after achieving the common victory and the struggle to preserve the very foundations of the human civilization 75 years ago, Moscow and Washington assumed primary responsibility for maintaining common peace and security according to the UN Charter. Basic principles of uh, international communication enshrined in this uh, document have eroded in recent decades. As a result, we witness an increasing chart and decrease of manageability in world politics. Coronavirus pandemic uh, has further underscored the dangerous trend towards a rising national egoism of states uh, to the detriment to their ability to jointly respond to mutual challenges. No, coincidentally, President of Russia, Vladimir Putin, in his latest article on the occasion of the 75th anniversary of victory in World War II, paid special attention to the history of shaping of the modern system of international relations. When the victorious powers proclaimed their commitment to act collectively, seek for compromises, and reject attempts to implement unilateral aspirations. It's our duty to preserve uh, global strategic uh, stability and uh, prevent local conflicts from spreading, for such conflicts can evolve into great wars. Today, it's more uh, crucial than uh, even to strengthen the institution designed to maintain world, war, uh, world order. In this uh, regard, the president of Russia put forward the initiative to convene a meeting of the heads of permanent member states of the UN Security Council. We believe uh, that such a summit would play an essential role in finding ways to improve the international uh, situation and prevent it from following a dangerous scenario with unpredictable consequences. I will not uh, dwell in uh, details on the causes of the deterior deterioration of Russian-American relations. I can only say that I consider their downward trajectory over the past 30 years with all uh, the ups and downs as the consequences of the failure to finish the Cold War with dignity on the basis of equality uh, without winners and losers. Uh, 
I emphasize that we are ready for constructive cooperation to the extent that Washington is ready for. Of course, uh, uh, for us, it's vital that our relations are readjusted on the basis of respect of, uh, for our legitimate interest and the need to find compromises on the issues important uh, to uh, Russia, not just in terms of engaging us in solving the task of the United States agenda. It would be no exaggeration to say that arms control issues have always been a core of the United States-Russian uh, relations. We are deeply concerned about the United States uh, actions leading to the collapse of strategic stability. The architecture of military restraint and mutual transparency that proved to be effective during the most difficult moments of the Cold War has become a burden to Washington. It's uh, de facto creating military strategic environment that is beneficial solely to the United States. Washington's goal is to be able to use forces whenever it fails to achieve its objectives with political tools. As history has uh, consistently demonstrated, the attempts to pursue uh, a foreign policy based on force or threat of using uh, force inevitably bring about international instability, growing uh, conflict, potential, and uh, confrontation. Its alternative uh, is uh, a cooperative approach to finding common solution uh, to the common pressing problem of global security. The United States uh, Russian strategic stability consultations provide one of the key uh, venues for such efforts. The latest uh, in the series of meetings took place uh, on June 22 in Vienna. The mere fact that two countries held such an event should be considered a positive signal. Instead of uh, practicing megaphone diplomacy, we need a direct conversation on the most pressing uh, issues. Uh, overall, the meeting was conducted in a positive manner. It uh, focused on the practical aspects of arms control, as well as approaches to international security problems. The important outcome was that parties confirmed their interest in continuing a dialogue. They also identified a few topics for further discussions. Uh, in particular, they agreed to hold a working group, on, uh, a working group meeting on space uh, issues. Uh, the two sides also decided to conduct an expert level meeting to discuss nuclear doctrines and strategies, including the use of nuclear weapons. They agreed to further examine verification and transparency issues. It's likely to be one of the most difficult topics as our country's approaches on these matters uh, differ uh, significantly. They will also discuss uh, the issues uh, related, related to all types of weapons capable of uh, performing strategic missions and affect strategic stability, which are not covered by any international restrictive regimes. The Russian delegation stressed that the arms control we would pursue with the United States should be based on parity and mutual respect for each other's interests and concerns. Therefore, we support a comprehensive approach to agreements in this area. We do not see any point in treaties that fail to take into account key factors affecting uh, strategic stability. For example, uh, the interrelation uh, uh, relationship between the offensive uh, and defensive strategic uh, systems. At the same time, the Vienna Dialogue revealed persistent differences between our countries on a number of key issues. The parties uh, could, non, could not achieve a common understanding on the extension of the New START Treaty and the so-called China factor. I hope that it will be time today to discuss with, with you uh, all these uh, elements. The Russian delegation reiterated its argument uh, 
uh, why under the current circumstances the extension of the treaty would be a reasonable and mutually beneficial step. It would not uh, only avert the risk of the nuclear arms race escalation and inevitable increase of military instability, but uh, would also provide space to overcome existing difficulties and agree on approaches to expand the possible scope and membership of future arms control uh, agreements. For those uh, reasons, uh, last December, Russia announced that it was ready to start discussions on technical issues related to the extension of the treaty immediately and without any preconditions. However, the United States, it uh, does not seem quite sufficient. We are convinced that preservation of arms control regime and strategic stability fa facilitates the search for mutually acceptable solutions. Contrary to the claims of certain United States uh, officials, this approach does not imply protecting outdated or obsolete formats uh, at all costs. It's about avoiding extreme steps when those uh, uh, who use arms control modernization as a pretext destroy its uh, uh, tried and true foundations. Amid global concerns over the collapse of the INF Treaty and uncertain future of New START, we deem it important to reassure everyone that we do not intend to drift towards confrontation fraught with the end of humankind. 18 months ago, we suggested that Russia and the United States should adopt a joint declaration on the inadmissibility of nuclear war. A positive reply has yet to be received, has not yet to be received. I would like to conclude with the words uh, of the Russian president said on June 24th at the military parade commemorating uh, the 75th anniversary of the victory in the Great Patriotic War, unquote. We understand how important it is to strengthen friendship and trust between nations, and we are open to dialogue and cooperation on most pressing uh, issues on the international agenda. Among them is creation of a common, reliable security system, some, something the complex and rapidly changing modern world needs. Only together can we protect the world from the from new dangerous threats, uh, the end of uh, quote. Here is another important uh, idea, uh, I unquote. In the end of the root of man's security does not lie in the weaponry, but in his mind. What the world requires is not a new race towards armament. It requires a new race towards reasonableness. We had better all run that race. The end of quote. These words were said not by Mr. Putin, but by Robert McNamara, more than half a century ago in San Francisco. Uh, we would like to invite the United States administration to take, uh, to take with us a concrete step in order to fulfill these aspirations of the American politician. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for that fascinating and sweeping exposition of Russian concerns and aspirations on foreign policy. This being Washington, however, before we delve into the big picture, I would like to ask you about an issue that is provoking a hue and cry here in the nation's capital, namely the issue of the purported Russian bounties in Afghanistan. My query to you is, has the Trump administration contacted the Russian government about this issue in any form since it became a public matter in recent weeks? Uh, of course, uh, Jacob, I would like to say that I also received a few questions uh, by email, and I hope that there will be opportunity for me to answer to them. Uh, I mentioned that they are about strategic uh, talks between the United States and Russia, about so-called Chinese factor, 
uh, about irritants and uh, positive uh, elements in Russian-American relations. I hope that we will cover them a little bit uh, later. I'm not Absolutely. Su <laughs> I'm not surprised that you have raised uh, this uh, issue. Uh, frankly, you see that I tried to establish constructive um, contacts and communication lines with American journalists. Uh, I would like to confirm today openly that the doors of Russian embassy are open for everybody who would like to know opinion, uh, Russian opinion on a various uh, subject. But uh, I have to say today uh, they, that uh, fake news, disinformation is very popular in the United States. Sometimes I'm shocked by reading some articles about so-called malign activities of one country or another one. And uh, I would like just only to flag my uh, maybe stupid question. What's about such words? I even write down them. Honesty, decency, self-respect, dignity, when we are talking about journalists. I know that uh, there is a lot of uh, famous and popular uh, mass media uh, that uh, publish uh, such so-called uh, news, but I would like to say you officially that these allegations distributed by the media are a downright lie. No concrete evidence has been presented. The authors of the insinuations are trying to create an impression that our country is an enemy of the United States. And by the way, don't forget that I have started my presentations, my remark from the message that the Russian Federation and the United States are not enemy. And I try to persuade uh, everybody who uh, lives in the United States. Seeking sensations, uh, some journalists aim to disrupt the dialogue between two countries, between uh, uh, ministers of foreign affairs, between uh, representatives of our countries on Afghanistan, Ambassador Kabulov and Ambassador uh, Halilzad. Uh, information provocations are poisoning the atmosphere of the cooperation and deflect attention from the need to intensify efforts to launch the inter-Afghan consultations to counter terrorist and drug threats emanating from Afghanistan. I would like, Jacob, to emphasize that we are ready and we are assisting United States uh, fighting terrorism in Afghanistan. We have a close cooperation. Not maybe you see that my poor English, maybe uh, it's, very, uh, it's better to say not cooperation, but uh, uh, consultations, uh, coordination, you see that because I remember that once I made a mistake uh, saying instead of uh, what discussion and negotiations, I was caught by one journalist saying, oh, come on. It means that there were negotiations between Russian and American president, but I just only made a mistake. So I would like to say to you that we are in close contact with um, uh, our American uh, official colleagues. And we are, of course, discussing all issues uh, regarding uh, this, uh, uh, this provocation news uh, published by some uh, mass media in the United States. But I would like, in the end, would like totally reject all acquisitions against uh, Russians. We are not interested uh, in a um, uh, victory of terrorism in Afghanistan. Jacob, Afghanistan is too close to us. We already lost so many thousand lives of Russian soldiers and officers. We understand how it is difficult and we wish success uh, United States negotiators uh, on this issue. We are in close contact with them. And it is, it is, it's a, it's a shame on those guys who are trying uh, to divide the line between uh, position of the Russian Federation and the United States on this uh, issue. Thank you for that uh, comprehensive answer. I, there's only one thing I would have to dispute, which is that your English is superb. Thank we you. have, you. of course, I will I'll smile once more. <laughs> we, 
We have a, a question from Richard Weitz who asks, how does the Russian government assess the results of this week's special conference on the future of the Open Skies Treaty? Uh, open Sky Treaty, of course, it's a very important issue. Uh, Jacob, I would like to say you that personally, uh, I have spent more than 30 years dealing with arms control, disarmament, and non proliferation. I remember how we have created uh, the architecture of arms control together with the United States, with other P5 uh, uh, members. And it's, uh, it's, uh, I would like to express my regret that the uh, United States decided to withdraw from some very important legally binding documents, treaties that uh, permit us to live in safe uh, open sky treaties. In light of the decision to withdraw from the open sky uh, treaty announced by the United States last May, it's important to remember that the treaty uh, is a relevant and viable means of strengthening confidence building measures and ensuring interaction of the participating state, including the military level. I would like to remind you that in the beginning, the United States uh, tried to persuade the Russian Federation to ratify this treaty. Uh, and the uh, United States did a lot of to persuade us. And uh, as usually in the end, we have agreed, we have ratified, and now um, we don't know what to do, what kind of efforts should we make uh, to persuade, uh, or maybe to dissuade uh, United States to return back uh, to this uh, treaty. Uh, given the shortage of dialogue forum between uh, Russia and uh, Western countries on military security issues, the loss of such an essential channel of expert communication will be hard to compensate for. Uh, you have mentioned that, uh, and you're right, on July 6, a special conference on the state parties to the Open Sky Treaties took place. The participants uh, in a video call format discussed the implications and future procedures of operation in connection with the United States announced decision to exit the treaty. Unfortunately, Jacob, unfortunately, Russia and the United States failed to bring together their positions. Uh, we consider that Washington showed no political will to seek mutually acceptable solution. Uh, it seems to me uh, the situation is uh, similar uh, to the situation with INF. When there was a decision to the United States, uh, by the United States to withdraw from INF, the United States uh, uh, has found it uh, uh, pretext, a pretext uh, to withdraw, blaming us, blaming the Russian Federation for a violation of this treaty. Uh, the same situation we see, we face uh, when we are talking about the decision of the United States to withdraw from uh, this treaty. But there is a difference. If you remember, INF was bilateral treaty. As to Open Skies uh, Treaty, it's multilateral uh, treaty. And uh, I just would like to raise a question. I don't want to torture you. I don't want uh, to ask from you any answer, but I would like you just only to think why the rest of NATO country, countries consider it important to stay in this treaty? Why just only one country decides to withdraw from this treaty? Moreover, uh, I would like to, uh, re uh, to refresh your memory saying that we have a special Open Skies Consultative Commission in Vienna where it's possible to discuss all uh, technical uh, problems. And by the way, we have also a lot of uh, technical concerns regarding uh, the implementation by the United States, uh, its obligations, commitments under this uh, treaty. And I would like raise one question maybe to myself, not to you, not to the United States. What kind of uh, steps should we take after withdrawal of the United States from this treaty? You know that this treaty permits us to fly over the territory 
of European countries as well as uh, United States and uh, Canada. Now, there will be no possibility for us to see what is going on on the territory of the United States. So we understand what kind of uh, joint communication lines are existing between NATO countries. And frankly, I'm hesitating that nobody will share information getting from its own planes regarding the situation uh, on the territory of a Russian Federation using the flights under the provisions of this uh, treaty. So we, I would like to say you that it's very serious uh, step made by United States. And I'm sure that the Ministry of Defense uh, and uh, other agencies uh, concerned will take appropriate steps, steps uh, in the end to, to protect the national interest of our motherland. I consider, Jacob, I am very much concerned by this section. I consider it's very counterproductive just only to withdraw from one treaty to another one. I uh, would like to remind you one uh, Japanese proverb. Uh, it's very easy to destroy uh, uh, a church. It will be needed just only one day. But to construct another one, it will take three years. So as a situation with the START Treaty, as a situation with the JCPOA, I consider it very important to respect achievements by our countries in this sphere, uh, to keep it alive, to keep, uh, to permit them to, to be alive and to try to uh, find a solution on various problems of the United States. So you said that uh, again, I just would like to uh, apply to the United States authorities to revisit uh, its decision and to, uh, to support our efforts to keep multilateral uh, arrangements agreement uh, in strategic sphere alive. Thank you. I now have an even grander question about grand strategy from someone who is a close observer of Russia and happens to be the chairman of the board of the Nash Center for the National Interest, Drew Guff, who asks, you mentioned both China and Mr. Putin's article in the national interest. Mr. Putin mentioned that the P5 will meet soon. Nuclear arms control may be an important topic. What are the realistic chances that China will finally join a discussion with the US and Russia on arms control in general and hypersonic missiles in particular? Jacob, it's not fair from your side. You have mentioned uh, at least three questions and uh, I don't know how to react because uh, all of uh, elements of your questions are very important. All elements, you said, the Chinese factor uh, initiative uh, introduced by uh, uh, Mr. Putin, and of course, a future talks on arms control, so-called tri trilateral uh, negotiation uh, for, uh, format uh, that United States uh, envisages uh, regarding uh, arms control. Could I start from a simple point? Maybe uh, it's uh, more easy to understand. It's a proposal uh, of uh, Vladimir Putin uh, on a meeting of five permanent uh, members of the UN Security Council. I would like to inform you that we have conveyed our proposals on the agenda to our partners. They include key issues affecting global politics, security, and economy. The date and venue of such a meeting are not yet determined. We think that it's important to reach an agreement on the substantial content on the summit before we move forward uh, to organization deta details. And Jacob, it's very uh, important to understand that uh, our intention is not just only focus on arms control issues during uh, negotiation negotiations between uh, P5 leaders. Uh, you see that we, uh, we can see such uh, meetings very seldom. It's a lot of pressing issues that our leaders have to discuss. Arms control issues uh, have to be just only one among comprehensive agenda that we are offering our friends uh, to discuss. 
because I'm sure that uh, Ch uh, China, uh, UK, and France uh, uh, have their own interest uh, to, uh, to flag during P5 meeting. Now, it's very interesting issue regarding so-called Chinese factor. Chinese uh, factor uh, was in the center of discussions in Vienna between our uh, delegation. And frankly, to my regret, uh, Washington has de facto taken the uh, START treaty hostage by insisting that its extension uh, is conditional on the progress in so-called trilateral arms control negotiation involving uh, China. The topic of so-called Chinese threat was the central part of United States statements at the Vienna meeting. Even maybe, Jacob, you remember the very famous uh, photo uh, of empty hall where there was flags of uh, China and the United States. So it was an uh, invitation to China to participate uh, in our bilateral discussions. Uh, Americans uh, pressed uh, for our support uh, for their ideas of transforming the bilateral discussions into a trilateral forum. The Russian delegation took notice of the arguments but made it clear that it should not be mistaken for agreement or intention to support the United States plans. Moreover, we are ready for any development of the situation with the new start. We are not going to save it at any cost, especially the one that Americans insist upon. We are open, Jacob, it's very important to understand we are not against of Chinese participation. We are open for multilateral discussions on possible measures to provide, pro, to provide predictability and restrain a new plan missile sphere. We consider it counterproductive to force someone to participate in such discussion. Consultations and negotiations of such nature must be conducted on the basis of consensus and with due regard for the legitimate interest of all parties. That is why uh, we consider that United States uh, attempts to put international pressure on China in order to make it participate in nuclear arms control unjustified. Russia, as you well know, gives priority to involving the UK and France in the dialogue. Why? Because they are nuclear uh, weapon states, they are members of NATO, and of course we are very much concerned what NATO is doing very close to Russian uh, territory. And by the way, I would like to give you uh, a few figures. According to CIPRI yearbook 2020, China has 320 nuclear warheads. I would like to emphasize all non-deployed at January 2020. According to Pentagon statistics, Jacob, they are open. You can find it in, uh, everywhere. China has around 90 ICBMs and 48 uh, SLBMs. So there is question to those guys who is in favor to invite China. Whether the Russian Federation and the United States are ready to decrease a quantity of warheads and missiles at the level of China has, or whether we invite China to increase a quantity of missiles and warheads to the extent that United States and Russia have. So there is a very uh, tricky, uh, very tricky uh, question uh, and we should be very cautious. Jacob, what we want from China? If anybody considers that China tomorrow will decide to freeze its capabilities in nuclear missile sphere, it will be naive. Of course, China is uh, uh, thinking about the, uh, how to say, uh, necessary defensive capabilities to protect its motherland. It's clear. And what can we offer? Just only uh, we would like, uh, we are, uh, we will insist, stop, develop your capabilities. Uh, by the way, what's about other countries who are uh, situated in uh, South uh, uh, 
Asia, India, Pakistan, and what's about other countries who possess uh, nuclear weapons? Why we have to signal out just only China? There is very serious question. And as we know, as we are aware, that uh, China's uh, position is crystal clear. At this stage, China is not ready uh, to join United States and Russian efforts uh, in, arm con in arms control sphere. And uh, Jacob, it seems to me that we have to respect such position. And Russia will not press on China to join our uh, bilateral talks. That question may have been difficult. I'm afraid I have an even trickier one from my colleague, George Beebe, who goes into the arena of American politics. And he asks, the US is clearly dealing with a number of serious internal tensions today. How does Russia regard these problems? I would like to amplify George's question and note that there is occasionally, you see in the American press, comparisons of the United States to the Brezhnev era stagnation, or even the tensions that Russia experienced in the 1990s. You've been here since 2017. What is your impression of America today, now that you've been here for several years? Has it changed during your stay as ambassador, or have you not been surprised by the events that have taken place? Of course, I am shocked. <laughs> I'm shocked uh, what I see today uh, in the United States. Nobody predicted that situation can be developed in such way. But uh, Jacob, I have to be very, very cautious. I'm ambassador of foreign country. Right. And, Jacob, you see that uh, I don't want any journalist uh, who is listening to me today blaming me after my uh, remarks saying that Ambassador Antonov uh, wants to interfere into the internal life of the United States. And Jacob, I, uh, I still want to continue to uh, implement or to fulfill my duties in the United States in Washington. That's why I consider that what is going on in the United States, it's internal a problem of the United States. And uh, it's American people who have a right uh, to make any remarks about uh, what is going on, how it will affect internal policy, how it will affect November uh, events in your country. As to me, best regards to Bibi. You, I respect him very much, uh, but uh, I'm a little surprised that he has decided uh, uh, to involve me in the discussions regarding internal situation in the United States. I hope that Bibi will not be offended if I will stop uh, here regarding um, remarks uh, uh, on what is going on in uh, the United States. At least I would like to convey this message to all uh, guys who are listening uh, to me that I would like uh, you to recover from this situation as soon as possible. We are very much interested to see the United States prosperous country. We are dependent. It's, imp it's impossible to imagine that in the United States it's possible to create any island of uh, safe, uh, safety life. And in another part of the world, it's uh, possible to live uh, in another world. So I wish you good luck. I wish you prosperity. And I would like to put uh, full stop here. Let's, let's move to the uh, foreign policy sphere. It's better. You said that it's more easy for me. And essentially, a, a similar question, which is, what is the overall state of U.S.-Russia relations? Is it, in fact, in a catastrophic situation right now? Or do you feel that there are glimmers for optimism in relations between the two countries? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your understanding that I prefer to speak about foreign policy uh, uh, of United States, by the way, as well as the Russian Federation. Of course, 
you see that I'm in Washington to defend uh, Russian foreign policy and at the same time to promote, to facilitate Russian-American relations. Uh, there are some positive shoots. We see the intensification of our dialogue uh, on the highest and high levels. In uh, compliance with the president's uh, arrangements, our countries helped each other with medical supplies in uh, combating the COVID pandemic. Maybe you are aware that uh, in, in the beginning of uh, uh, this um, uh, pandemic, uh, there was a decision by Russian Federation to assist the United States uh, to fight against uh, this disease. And uh, recently, the United States president uh, has decided to send us 200 ventilators and uh, we highly uh, appreciate uh, this uh, gesture from United uh, States, uh, from uh, American president, as well as uh, American uh, people. And by the way, everything was done free of charge. Free of charge, it's very important uh, to understand. Uh, we are trying to stabilize uh, energy, uh, energy, city, uh, or energy markets. And our president discussed this issue um, during their uh, phone conversation. The dialogue uh, between the ministers of foreign affairs, the defense ministers and the chief of uh, staff is also uh, developing. Uh, we also look forward uh, to resuming the uh, consultations between the Security Council. And it's very important, Jacob, you said that uh, I'm here, it's already three years, but I failed to, um, to establish uh, contacts with the Congress, and I'm in favor to restore context between our legislative uh, bodies. Of course, uh, we cannot avoid differences. However, continuity of bilateral context, especially uh, on the highest level, helps to prevent United States-Russian uh, relations from falling into the abyss. Unfortunately, it's not uh, always uh, possible to implement in practice the constructive tone of the president's uh, talks. The idea uh, of establishing the business advisory council as well as non-governmental expert council, which uh, were discussed during Helsinki summit, are still on the negotiating uh, table. Uh, in addition, uh, it's very important to add that uh, in addition to the already mentioned consultation on strategic stability, we reestablish, we established the working group on counterterrorism. Let us not forget the terrorist attacks in Russia, which were prevented with the help of the United States Special Services. Uh, in its turn, uh, the Russian side was one of the first to support the United States after the tragic events on September 11, 2001. We warned about the preparation of terrorist attack in Boston by Tsarnaev brothers. And uh, I also have to add that we have a regular dialogue on Syria, Afghanistan, Venezuela, Korean Peninsula nuclear issue, and some other topics. Cooperation in uh, the peaceful exploration of outer space also remains productive and uh, this um, uh, issue was mentioned by our president during uh, uh, their latest uh, conversation. Uh, I believe uh, that our countries uh, could do a lot of to overcome the COVID-19 pandemic, including joining efforts uh, of doctors uh, and scientists uh, in developing treatment and preventive methods to fight this disease. Uh, I have a final question. I know your time is limited. From Carol Morello of the Washington Post. Briefly, she asks, how will Russia respond if the U.S. attempts to trigger snapback sanctions against Iran? Excuse me, excuse, could you repeat again? She asks, how, Carol Morello at the Washington Post asks, how will Russia respond if the United States attempts to trigger snapback sanctions against Iran, since Russia has made it clear that it does not support extending the arms embargo against Iran and the Security Council. Today, I have used many times the word regret. I have to repeat it again. I regret 
that United States decided to withdraw from JCPOA. You, as to us, uh, we understand all advantages and disadvantages of this uh, plan. But at the same time, when we reached agreement on uh, JCPOA, it was a compromise, a compromise between the United States, Iran, Russia, UK, France, uh, and of course, uh, who else? And European Union, European Union, maybe. It's better to, uh, to add. Uh, United States decided to withdraw from uh, JC, uh, JCPOA. It means that United States has no any right to trigger or to start snapback provision in uh, resolution uh, UN Security Council 2231. Uh, we consider uh, that in accordance with all provisions, uh, uh, United States has no right and that's why uh, we can't see um, uh, any legal and technical base for such a decision. And it goes without saying that we, are, uh, we will be opposing any actions uh, on this track from the United States. We would like to confirm that uh, JCPOA is a very important instrument to deal with the so-called um, uh, nuclear uh, Iranian issue. And uh, it's a lot of room of maneuvers if you look at uh, this plan uh, as it is uh, now. Uh, we uh, would like to invite United States to return back uh, to our community in Vienna, in uh, Washington, in Moscow, uh, in uh, other uh, Western European uh, capitals, but we don't want to discuss this issue in New York, in the Security Council. Well, Ambassador Antonov, it was very generous of you to take the time to participate in our webinar today. And I want to thank you profusely for answering the questions and discussing the contentious U.S.-Russia relationship with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You have raised today a lot of interesting questions uh, due to shortage of time. Of course, we failed to discuss with you INF because the problem of middle-range missiles is very sensitive. It's very important, but I hope that it will be a possibility for us to meet again and to discuss this issue as well as uh, other that are very important for the security of all uh, countries. I would like to wish you good health and I wish you good luck. And thank you very much, uh, everybody who uh, participates in our discussion. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. And with that, we'll conclude our session. Thank you.